What's up guys, Laura Whitmore here with Strategic Test Prep. I know some of you are skeptical. You're thinking, there's no way I can get a 700 or above not reading the passages on the SAT. Well, today I am here in this video to prove you wrong. I'm gonna show you exactly how to tackle the answer-seeking strategy for an entire test and still get a 700 or above. Now, it's not really fair if I look at a test that I know inside and out. So I'm gonna work off of the October 2022 reading section, which full disclosure, I've seen one time when I went into a school to take it. I don't remember much about it, to be honest with you. So you'll really be able to see my thought process and how I work through things, even when I don't know the answer. I would encourage you to open up the October 2022 test. You can get it with a quick Google search and follow along with me. You should pause the video and try to answer the questions as we go, see if you're on the same track as me. And just a heads up, I pulled the conversion chart for this test and I need to get at least 10 or less wrong on this section to score a perfect 700. So at the end of this video, we'll score it and make sure the answer seeking strategy is up to snuff. All right, here we go. All right, so our first passage is always the fiction. I'm gonna go straight to the questions. Now, number one is a main idea question, so I definitely don't wanna answer that. But number two is a very specific question, even though it's not an answer-seeking question. It's asking about the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago, and it says, it's asking why Tiffany looks forward to it. Now, I know that the questions track with the passage, meaning they typically go in order with the passage. I'm gonna go find this answer right now. I'm gonna look up towards the beginning of the passage, and I'm gonna look for the World's Columbian Exposition. Here it is. And I'm gonna see where in the text that he talks about why he's looking forward to it. It says, only 15 months away, in 1893, the name of Louis Comfort Tiffany will be on the lips of millions. Now, what that tells me is Tiffany thinks that he's going to become famous after going to this exposition. So let me go see if I can find an answer that says that. Gain greater popular recognition. That sounds good to me. All right, let's go check out the next one. Now, the next one's a double. Oh, no, it's not. Sorry. I thought it was because of number four. Next one says the narrator indicates that Tiffany informs her of his new projects by. Well, again, this is kind of specific. It's not a main idea question. And since they track, I know it's going to be after where we just were. So I'm going to go look at maybe a word or phrase that means new projects. Okay, so there's a few things I'm seeing. He like puts his, his open palm on her back, ushering her to his massive carved mahogany, mahogany exhibit. And it says he's practically hopping from side to side, which kind of denotes that he's very excited about it. So let's go see if we can find an answer. Okay, I'm not seeing an answer that matches it, so I'm gonna keep looking. So he's unrolling his largest watercolor for her. And he's slaying down one large watercolor after another. So it doesn't sound like he's soliciting her opinion. He's just like showing her all his watercolors just as an excited person would. Okay, so I finally found the textual evidence here. So it says um, their, their watercolors are like Persian carpet, each one a precise fine edge rendering of what he wanted the window to be. So he's showing her watercolors that he intends to be stained glass windows. They weren't finished yet, they were just watercolors. He did not ask her opinion. He did not display a chart. So we are good on that one. Okay, number four, it says, which choice best supports the idea that the narrator recognizes the potential importance of her contribution to Tiffany's business? So we're looking for the potential importance of her contribution to Tiffany's business and where she recognizes that. So we're gonna start with line 34, my breath to lips. My breath whistled between my open lips. That line says nothing about her recognizing her importance in the endeavor. We're going to go 46 to 47, 0 2 to Hughes. Oh, to get my hands on those gorgeous Hughes, that doesn't say anything about her recognizing her importance. Line 69, I was to idea. 
I was struck by a tantalizing idea. Well, this might be something I would say because if she thinks it's a tantalizing idea, then she recognizes it's important, possibly. So let's hold that. We're going to check line 79. Just whispered. Just think where that could go, I whispered. Ooh, that also sounds like uh, the potential importance of her contribution to Tiffany's business. At the end of the day, though, I think that she has a vision. And when she says, just think where that can go, that really says that she finds this to be important. Just and, and the potential in it. I think potential is a key word where that could go. It's kind of like stating what she sees the potential in it. The other one, if it's a tantalizing idea, it doesn't mean it could be important or it has potential. So I'm going to go with D. Okay, five, as used in line 38, true most nearly means. Okay, so I'm going to go up to 38. Let's see, where is true? Okay, the thorns are placed by large glass jewels in true Tiffany style. And characteristic Tiffany style. Okay, I'm just going with the one that makes the most sense in that sentence in the context. Six, in context, the narrator's reference to a pipe organ mainly serves to, okay, let's go to line 41, pipe organ. Okay, here's pipe organ. So astonishing how he could get more watercolors so deep and saturated, so like lacquer that they vibrated together as surely as chords of a great church pipe organ. Even the names of the hues bore an exotic richness. Okay, so they vibrated together like chords of the pipe organ. Let's go see if we can find that. Sounds like vividness because they're talking about the hues. So I'm going to go with that. Okay, seven, the narrator's remarks in lines 53 to 54, I see to chapel in lines 58 to 59, what to information are best described as expressing the narrator's... Okay, we're going to read I see to chapel and what to information. So I see your originality is in good health. Only you would put peacocks in a chapel. And then what was the other one? 58 to 59, what information? What a lucky find for you, that convenient tidbit of information. And she's talking to Tiffany here because it's in the I form. So it's the narrator. It sounds like amusement. Only you would put peacocks in a chapel. So I'm going to go with B. In context, the description in lines 66 to 68, he looked to thing, contributes to the passage's overall characterization of Tiffany mainly by, okay, I want an overall characterization of Tiffany, how it contributes. Let's read 66 to 68. So 66 to 68 says, he looked at it with nothing short of love and showed me its size with outstretched arms as though he were hugging the thing. So he's very passionate about his work. He loves his work. Let's find something that goes with that. Okay, it's not his own importance. He's not admiring himself. Conveying his preference for creating large-scale artworks. Maybe, I mean, if he's hugging it, obviously he prefers it. Demonstrating the personal warmth he expresses towards others. Well, it's not towards others because he's actually like hugging the artwork. Emphasizing the intensity of his excitement about his work. Yes, that's the one. Okay, number nine, it can most reasonably be inferred. Oh, it's a double with 10. So I'm going to go ahead and link these because this says the answer to the previous question. Nine says it can most reasonably be inferred from the passage that the narrator's talents include an ability to. So we're looking for lines that talk about the narrator's talents. I know that typically the questions track with the passage. So in 10, when I look for something about the narrator's talents, I'm actually going to start with D and work my way up. So let's start with 69 to 72. Imagine to lampshade. Imagine it reduced in size and made of translucent glass instead. Once you figure out how to secure the pieces in a dome, that could be the method and the shape of a lampshade. Okay, let's see. Um, well, she has an ability to, to have a vision and to make a suggestion and modify the, his creative approach. Let's see if there's a match to that, because that could be the right lines. Devise imaginative names for the colors. No, that wouldn't be a match. Enhance an existing idea by improving technical innovations and in artworks. Maybe B and D are a match. 
um, improvising technical innovations. Yeah, she's making it into a lampshade. I think that's what she, I think that that's enhancing an existing idea because he was gonna make windows of stained glass. She wants to make it into a lampshade. I'm gonna go D and B. I'm pretty confident with that. We're moving on. Maybe I would doubt these to come back to just to check later if I have extra time. Let's uh, just go ahead and do that uh, main idea question and then we're gonna go to the next passage. Hopefully these detailed questions are gonna help me answer this main idea question without having to go back into the passage too much. It says, which choice best describes what happens in the passage? The narrator reflects on how the behavior of another character has changed, no. The narrator struggles to understand the motivations of another character, no. The narrator discusses shared professional interests with another character, absolutely, they both love art. The narrator recounts the events that led another character to support her project. This is just one snapshot in time. It's not multiple events. I don't like D, I'm gonna go with C. Next passage. Okay, let's just read the blurb. We didn't do it the last time, we really should. Let's at least know what the passage is about. It says, this passage is adapted from Richard, Florida. Bigger isn't necessarily better when it comes to city size. Okay, I get a sense of his tone. He doesn't think big cities are really all that great. Um, this sounds like a social science to me because it's talking about city size, which deals with people's behaviors. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna skip 11 because it's a main idea question. Let's go to 12. It says, which choice best supports the idea that a country's unique circumstances are likely to distort comparisons between its economic growth and urban population size and those of other countries? Wow, there's a lot in that question. I'm just gonna try to pull out some key information. Distort comparisons uh, between economic growth and urban population size, and we're also looking at other countries as well. Now they track, so with the passage, I'm thinking one to four could be a good choice, or 14 to 16, but let's start with one to four, a pair to world. A pair of recent studies suggests that although industrialized nations may have benefited from larger cities, the same is not true for the rapidly urbanizing areas of the developing world. Okay. I don't really know if um, that's the answer. I'm gonna have to come back to that. It's, it seems like it's touching on some things, but I'm kind of like holding out. Maybe I'll see something better that really just hits me in the face. Let's go 14 to 16 to ensure to factors. To ensure robustness, it controls for variables including national population size, physical land area, education levels, economic openness, and other factors. I don't think that that answers the question. Okay, we're looking for a country's unique circumstances. I'm going to go back to one to four real quick. A pair of recent studies suggest that although industrialized nations may have benefited from larger cities, the same is not true for rapidly urbanizing areas of the developing world. I don't know. Let's go to 32 to 35, advance to period. Now at this point, it's important to just not um, panic, right? This one I'm having a tougher time with, but I'm gonna have plenty of time because I'm doing answer seeking and I'm not reading them, so I'm not stressing it right now. Advanced nations experience a 0.7% increase in economic growth for every additional 100,000 in average population among its large cities over a five year period. Okay, well that's just talking about advanced nations. And I don't see anything about distorting comparisons. So um, let's go ahead and try 44 to 45, bigger to countries. Bigger cities tend to have a more positive economic impact in larger countries. Hmm. Okay, here's what I'm gonna do. I th I'm gonna go with A because I know it tracks. I'm not confident in it, but I wanna move on. So I'm gonna star this one to come back to. And maybe if I answer these other detailed questions, it will give me a sense of what the right answer is for that and I'll go back to it. But none of them really seem like a good match to me. I might be missing something. So I'm just gonna go with A for now. Remember, I can get 10 wrong and still get a 700. Based on the passage, which choice best describes the relationship between Frick and Rodriguez Pose's first and second studies? Okay, so I'm looking for these guys' names. I'm looking for the first and second studies. Okay. The two studies they talked about were at the top by Frick and Rodriguez. Take a close look at the actual connection between city size and nationwide economic performance. 
Their initial study, I need that, from last year examines the relationship between economic development as measured by GDP per capita and average metropolitan area size in 114 countries across the world between 1960 and 2010. Okay, this is what that last question was talking about. It was talking about um, economic development, the relationship between that and um, city size. It was talking about different um, unique uh, circumstances and countries. So I think I've hit the nail on the head when I just read the to ensure robustness um, lines. I didn't have enough context. I should have read before it. I'm going to go back and I'm going to change my answer to 12 to B because those are the factors that would distort the measurements of those things. So we're going to go with B on that one. I'm in the same area now. Okay, now we're doing the relationship between their first and second study. So that's what their first study did. It studied the relationship between economic development and, and city size. Okay, where does it talk about their second study? I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. Okay, in their latest study. So I see it here in this topic sentence. The researchers found that developing nations tend to get a bigger bang for their buck from smaller and medium-sized cities. These countries see the most economic benefit from having a larger proportion of their urban population living in cities of 500,000 people or less. Okay, so small cities are beneficial to um, developing countries and large cities are, are beneficial to developed countries, countries that are, are like westernized countries. So let's see. Oop. Okay, let's see. So. No, it doesn't correct a minor error. No, it doesn't confirm a hypothesis. Um, no, it doesn't offer a more negative interpretation. I think it builds on the first study's findings. As used in line 29, feature most nearly means, okay, let's go to line 29. Urbanization has historically been thought of as a necessary feature of economic development and growth is a necessary specialty of economic development and growth, is a necessary component. I don't even have to read them all. All right, just go with your gut on those. Pick the one that sounds best, keep it simple. Notice how I'm not overthinking these questions. I'm literally just going with my gut and picking the one that makes sense and moving on. All right, this is a double, which is great. They go together because it says answer the previous question. So I do have lines to go off of for this next one. I'm gonna read the question to 15. It can most reasonably be inferred from the passage that a mega city, okay, I'm looking for a mega city, economic impact on a country is, okay, I need lines that talk about mega cities. I don't think it's in seven to 10, we're already past that point. Let's start with 30 to 32, while to not. While advanced nations benefit from having larger cities, developing nations do not. I don't see anything about mega cities there. We are gonna get rid of that one. 48 to 51, this to economies. This makes sense. Bigger, more developed countries are more likely to play host to knowledge-based industries that require urban agglomeration economies. Oh, okay. Do I see mega cities mentioned yet? Up to that point, I do not. But I do see mega cities mentioned in the next paragraph. So I think that the lines for mega cities will be in this next paragraph. So I'm gonna get rid of 48 to 51 and we're gonna read 58 to 60. Again, just as a reminder, I'm looking for a mega city's economic impact from a country. So 58 to 60, this to prosperity. This history has created a false expectation that urbanization is always associated with prosperity. Mm. No, I'm almost wondering if the sentence in the last paragraph is introducing the concept of megacities. I'm wondering if a urban agglomeration economies um, is a megacity. So I'm going to start by trying to find a match to the third set of lines. So this makes sense. I don't know what this is, by the way. So I'm going to read the sentence before it. Having a metro with more than 10 million inhabitants. Okay, okay. So now I see lines, and I'm so glad I read back to, to clarify what this meant. It says, having a metro with more than 10 million inhabitants, that's gotta be a mega city. 
produces a nationwide economic benefit only if the total urban population is 28.5 million or more according to the study. This makes sense. Bigger, more developed countries are more likely to play host to knowledge-based industries that require urban agglomeration economies. Okay, so I'm gonna go back and where am I? <laughs> I'm actually gonna pick 48 to 51 and then I need to find a match to that. Greater in countries with larger, nope, they didn't talk about physical land areas, that's a no. Dependent on the types of companies located in the megacity, maybe, because they did talk about the economy a little bit. Relatively equal for developed, no, we know that's not equal. Neutralized by the economic cost of maintaining, nope, okay, they talked about the, um, they talked about the types of companies because they said, just as a reminder to you guys, they said bigger, more developed countries are more likely to play host to knowledge-based industries. Knowledge-based industries, that's the type of companies that are in there. Okay, we're going to go to the next one. The main purpose of the sixth paragraph, lines 52 to 60. Okay, I'm going to go to the sixth paragraph. Where? Okay, 52 to 60. So it talks more about the megacities. There are several reasons why megacities, and we should always read the footnote, just a heads up. So I would go down and read number one. Typically defined as cities with populations over 10 million people. No way. Like, I didn't already realize that. But thank you anyways, College Board. Uh, there are several reasons why megacities often fail to spur significant growth in the rapidly ur urbanizing world. For one, the lion's share of places that are urbanizing most rapidly today are in the poorest and least developed parts of the world. Okay, that makes sense. Obviously, the poorest places are going to urbanize the most rapidly because they have a lot more uh, room to catch up and to grow and to change. Whereas the places that urbanized a century or so ago were in the richest and most developed. This history has created a false expectation that urbanization is always associated with prosperity. False expectation. Okay, provide an overview of existing megacities in high income and developing countries, maybe. Develop a claim about the effect of large cities in various parts of the world, maybe. Identify a widely accepted theory about city size that future research should be able to confirm. No, they're actually disproving a theory right now, saying it's not always true. Compare causes of urbanization in the past with those in the present. Okay, oof, I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna check one more time. Um, they fail to spur significant growth in the rapidly urbanizing world. The lion's share of places that are urbanizing most rapidly today are in the poorest and least developed parts of the world. Whereas the places that urbanize a century, okay, so today versus a century ago. And it, they're talking about, they said this history. So I'm gonna go pick the answer that talks about the time. So um, in the past with those in the present. Right. As used on line 69, producing most nearly means, let's go to line 69. Okay, producing. The, the result is that the connection between large cities and growth has now become more tenuous, producing a troubling new pattern of urbanization without growth. Creating. Okay, now we have a couple graph questions. According to the graph, during what range of years did the median city population size in developing countries initially surpass that of high income countries? Okay, so I'm gonna go to the graph. Okay, me median city population size. I wanna see, okay, when developing countries surpass, which looks like it's about here, which would be like 1995-ish or like 92-ish. Yep, 1990, 1995. Which claim from the passage is best supported by the graph? Now, when you have to synthesize information between the passage and the graph, these are some of the hardest questions. I may be better off guessing on this one and coming back to it, but I'm just gonna try it quickly. We'll see how it goes. Okay, so the thing too is this is a very broad question. So I have to read every single answer choice and try to eliminate as I go so it's a more time consuming question than the last one where they gave me specifics and I just went and looked for the information. We have the median population of cities in developing countries grew more sharply from 1960 to 2010 than did that of cities in high income countries. Okay, I'm going to go from 1960 to 2010 and see what happens with the developing countries. Did it grow more sharply? 1960 to 2010 is a whole graph. It looks like a, a bigger slope, so I'm actually gonna go with that one and I'll doubt it to come back to so I can check the other ones later. But I'm okay with that answer, that looks good to me. 
Okay, next passage. Now we have the hug slug. And I remember when I took this, I did not like it because it's a science and I'm not a fan of science. But let's start by just reading the blurb. It says, passage one is adapted from humans' big brains, maybe partly due to three newly found genes by genetic engineering and biotechnology news. Passage two is adapted from Matt Wood. Brain size of human ancestors evolved gradually. Okay, so passage two believes that brain size evolved gradually. And passage one believes it's due to three genes. Okay, we're gonna go straight to the questions, guys. I don't wanna, I really don't wanna read this one, I'm not gonna lie. So, <clears throat> what does passage one indicate is true of the human genome? You know what? I'm not sure if this is a main idea question or not. So, knowing that it tracks with the passage, I think I'm gonna come back to it. I wanna do the double and see where the answer is for 23, and then I'm gonna look before that for 21. So let's start with 22 and 23. It says, based on passage one, what concept most likely contributed to Hostler's team's initial interest of notch 2NL? Okay, I'm looking for initial interest. Let me read lines 20 or 11 to 14, it's to make. Okay, it's a relative of notch two. I don't know what it's is. So again, I have to read the sentence before to get the context. So it says about six years ago, scientists in David Hausler's lab at Howard Hughes Medical Institute discovered a gene called notch two NL. It's a relative of notch two. Okay, now if they discovered it, that sounds initial to me. So I kind of like that word. It says it's a relative of notch two, a gene that scientists knew was central to early brain development. Okay, it's a relative. Um, notch two controls vital decisions regarding when and how many neuron, when and how many neurons to make. Okay, so maybe they think because it's a relative, initially they thought it would also um, associate with brain development. So the discovered, since it sounds like initial, I'm actually going to try to find a match to those lines right now. I like lines 11 through 14. Um, let's see. Similar genes often play different roles in the... Okay, nope, they don't talk about different roles. A single gene typically has varying functions. Nope, they're not talking about varying functions. Genes that are near one another in a genome usually are duplicated. They don't talk about duplicating. Genes that are related to one another tend to have comparable biological roles in development. I think that's the one because they just talked about how those two genes are related to each other. Okay, now that I know 11 to 14 was the answer to 23, I'm actually gonna go before that to try to answer 21. So what do they indicate is true of the human genome? Hopefully it's before that, we'll try. If not, we'll doubt it to come back to. The brains of humans are conspicuously larger than the brains of other apes, but the human specific genetic factors responsible for the uniquely large human neocortex remain obscure. Since humans split from chimps, which have brains roughly a third of human size, the human genome, that's what I'm looking for, has undergone roughly 15 million changes. Which of these genetic tweaks could have led to big brains? Well, what I'm getting that's true about the human genome is that it iterates and changes a lot. Can we find an answer to that? Oh my God, too easy. It's gone through a large number of changes over time. Thank you, College Board. That one was a gift. Okay, now we're going to be moving on to passage two, it looks like. So 24 says, which choice from passage two best supports the idea that brain size research may help answer important questions and realms beyond evolutionary biology? Okay, so brain size research help answer important questions and realms beyond, beyond evolutionary biology. Let's check some of these lines. 47 to 51, scientists to years. Scientists don't agree on when and how this dramatic, I don't know what this is, so I've got to read back a line. Modern humans have brains that are more than three times larger than our closest living relatives, chimpanzees and bonobos. Scientists don't agree on when and how this dramatic increase took place, but new analysis of 94 hominin fossils shows that average brain size increased gradually and consistently over the past three million years. All right, so we're looking for, um, the idea that brain size research may help answer important questions in realms beyond evolutionary biology. I'm not sure if I'm getting that there, but I do like that it's first and usually the questions track with the passage. I'm gonna hold it and see if I can find something better. 52 to 57, the research to part. 
The research published in the Proceedings of Royal, B, uh, Royal Society B shows that the trend was caused primarily by evolution of larger brains within populations of individual species. But the introduction of new larger brain species and extinction of smaller brain ones also plays a part. Oh my goodness. I am not sure right now. I don't feel like I'm getting beyond evolutionary biology. So I'm going to keep going. 58 to 63, brain to study. <clears throat> brain size is one of the most obvious traits that makes us human. It's related to cultural complexity, language, tool making, and all the other things that make us unique, says Andrew Dew, PhD, a postdoctoral scholar at the University of Chicago and first author of the study. I don't think I'm getting it there. 66 to 72, due to humans. Dew and his colleagues compared published research data on skull volumes of 94 fossil specimens from 13 different species. Ah, beginning with the earliest unambiguous human ancestors. I feel like this is getting too specific. So I don't know. I don't think that that's going to be the right one. I'm going to get rid of that. Okay, so we're going to go back to 47 to 51 one more time. The uh, scientists don't agree on when and how this dramatic increase took place, but new analysis shows the average brain size increased gradually and consistently over the past 3 million years. Now I'm going to read the next one. The research shows that the trend was caused primarily by evolution of larger brains. So now they're talking about evolution within populations of it. But the introduction of new larger brain species and extinction also plays a part. So I think that it's going to be B because it mentions evolution. They said beyond evolutionary biology and they're saying, but this other thing also plays a part. So I'm going to go with B. All right, line 53, trend most nearly means. Let's go to line 53. <clears throat> 53, trend. Where are you, trend? Oh, there we go. The research published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society B shows that the trend was caused primarily by evolution of larger brains. Okay, shows that the progression. Okay, the main purpose of the fifth paragraph of passage two is to, okay, so that's line 73 to 81. The researchers saw that when the, okay, so this is their findings from the studies, it sounds like. The researchers saw that when the species were counted at the clade level, or groups descending from a common ancestor, the average brain size increased gradually over three million years. Looking more closely, the increase was driven by three different factors, primarily evolution of larger brain sizes within individual species populations, but also by the addition of new larger brain species and extinction of smaller brain ones. All right. Define a term, not doing that. Indicate the original objectives, not indicating objectives. Summarizing the conclusions, yes, they're saying they found findings. All right. Um, in the context of passage two, the reference to a football coach in lines 84 to 88, due to ones, mainly serves to, okay, let's go to 84 to 88. Now notice how it says, likens it to start that. So what is it? We've got to read the sentence before to get that context. So I'm going to start at the top of the paragraph. The study quantifies for the first time when and by how much each of these factors contributes to the clade level pattern. Dew said he likens it to how a football coach might build a roster of bigger, stronger players. One way would be to make all the players hit the weight room to bulk up. But the coach could also recruit new, larger players and cut the smallest ones. Okay, good analogy. Create a humorous way. I don't think it's being funny. Establish an analogy. Ah, I just said that. Okay, sometimes if you summarize things, then you'll end up falling on the right answer. <laughs> Okay, 28. Which choice best describes a key difference between the passages? Well, we already know the first one doesn't feel like it happened gradually like the second one does. Passage 1 refers only to data derived from computer simulations. I don't remember them mentioning that. Passage 1 addresses genetic analysis of the brains of human ancestors only, while Passage 2 addresses genetic analysis of the brains of multiple primate species. Maybe. I'll have to go back and check. Passage 1 limits its discussion to evolutionary changes in recent human history, while Passage 2 con considers changes over millennia. That sounds gradual to me. I like that answer. Passage 1 focuses on small-scale genetic changes that influence brain 
evolution. Yeah, they did say th there was three gene changes. Well, passage two focuses on the influence of large scale population level changes. That might be it too. Um, let's just go back and see if passage one is just talking about recent human history. It says, the three genes exist only in humans and their recent relatives, not in chimpanzees. Okay. Hmm. And they're just studying humans. In this one, they said that they're studying 13 different species in Passage 2. So I guess going back in a quick glance, I'm thinking that... Um, it's going to be B. Holy Moses. This one's a hard one. Okay. I'm going to start this to come back to, but again, I can miss 10 and get a 700. So we're just going to let that one go for now. 29. Both passages state that the modern human brain is about three times larger than the brains of... Now, I remember them mentioning bonobos and chimpanzees. Let's see which one they mentioned in both passages. Uh -uh. Okay. Um, passage one mentions chimps, not bonobos. It says from chimps. And so we're going to go with chimps. As used in line 58, passage 2, obvious, is closest in meaning to which word is used in passage 1. Let's go to 58, obvious. Brain size is one of the most obvious traits that makes us human. It's related to cultural complexity. Da, 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 da. Language, tool making. Okay, so it's an obvious trait. Um, what would it relate to in passage one? Conspicuously, line one. The brains of humans are conspicuously larger. Yeah, that means obviously larger. We'll go with that. Inconspicuous would mean not obvious because I-N is a prefix that when you put it in front of a word, it means not whatever the word is. So it's got to be conspicuous. Okay, we're. I think we're moving on. Let's just check and make sure we didn't leave any out. We answered all of those. So now we're on to the next passage, which this one I remember vaguely from taking the test. It says it was written in 20, 2008, but I do recall that this passage was written very eloquently and in a sophisticated way where it mimicked an old passage from the 1800s or early 1900s. So I would classify this passage as your old one. The passage is adapted from a speech delivered by Tom Calma, still writing for freedom, by Australian Human Rights Commission. Aboriginal Australians and the Torres Strait Islanders are the indigenous peoples of Australia. Okay, so I know it's about um, indigenous peoples and, you know, Aboriginal Australians and their freedom. Now I'm going to go to the questions. Central theme, that's a main idea. We're going to skip 31. 32. According to Calma, the government's failure to link its expenditures, this sounds specific, guys, on indigenous health initiatives to specific health outcomes is harmful. Okay, expenditures I know means spending money. <laughs> and we're looking for health initiatives. And since it tracks with the passage, I'm going to try to look um, up kind of high. And I'm also looking for where they talk about the government. <clears throat> where do they talk about the government's expenditures spending money okay i see right here in this paragraph federal government expenditure i'm gonna read there the focus on practical measures was exemplified by the emphasis the previous federal government placed on the record levels of expenditure annually on indigenous issues. So it sounds like the government would argue that they spent tons and tons of money on the indigenous peoples. Okay, and then the author says, as I previously asked, since when did the size of the input become more important than the intended outcomes? Oh, okay, so what he's saying here is, hey, the more money you spend, that doesn't matter if you're not getting results. Okay, let's try to find an answer that reflects that. <clears throat> allows the government to evade the obligation to be answerable for its policies. Yep, that's the one because they're saying, hey, but we're spending tons of money on this. And the other saying, yeah, but nothing's happening because of that. Like, be accountable. Okay, um, 33. Kalma indicates that in the past, the Australian government stressed which aspect of its relationship to indigenous peoples. Okay, we're looking for in the past. Um, how did the government talk about its relationship to indigenous peoples? And I'm going to go after where we just were. Okay, I see past five years. 
So the government took a practical approach. It allowed the governments to devise a whole series of policies and programs without engaging with indigenous peoples in any serious manner. Okay, let's see if we can find an answer that matches that. Okay, I don't see any match to that, so I'm going to keep looking. Um, that is government policy that is applied to indigenous peoples as passive recipients. Okay. Our challenge now is to redefine and understand these issues as human rights issues. We have, face a major challenge in scaling up government and bureaucracy. Hmm. I feel like I'm going too far and I'm not getting the past. So... <clears throat> Hmm. I have previously described this as the fundamental flaw. I'm back on line 39 of the federal government's efforts over the past five years. The government policy that has applied to indigenous peoples as passive recipients. Hmm. Okay, so this one's a this one's a tricky one for me. I can't easily find the textual evidence. So what I'm gonna do right now, because I don't want to waste too much time. Um I don't think it talked about the willingness to meet with indigenous leaders. It might have expressed regret. I can't find that right now. The improvements it has made on... Um, I would just probably go with the financial resources it is devoted to indigenous issues. It's a passive way that they were trying to help. And it kind of connects with the question before it about just spending a lot of money. So I'm going to go with that one and I'm going to star it. I think maybe I was like overlooking that initially and I thought too hard about this one, but it's time to move on. So as used in line 30, decide most nearly means. And the fact is that there have been no simple way of being able to decide whether the progress made through record expenditure has been good enough to determine. Based on the passage, Kalma would likely agree that programs related to indigenous issues would have a better chance of succeeding if the Australian government, okay, and I know it started right here. We face a major challenge in scaling up government and the bureaucracy so they are capable of utilizing human rights as a tool for best practice policy developed as an accountability mechanism. Okay, using human rights as a tool. Um, do, 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 do. Okay, here are the things that they think the government should be doing. A long-term plan of action that's evidence-based. Um, ensure the full participation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Um, oh, I like that. So they want them to participate to address their health needs. I think I saw an answer that said that. Yes. Empowered Indigenous communities assist in devising. So they're participating. That's the synonym there. Oh my gosh. Which choice for us the best evidence? I didn't notice it was a double. That's my fault. I should have already linked that. So let's see if I can find a match there. So 38 to 41, I have to recipients. Um, 38 to 41. I have previously described this as a fundamental flaw. Nope. Okay, 24 to 28, I think that's too far back. As I previously asked, since when is the size of the input? Okay, no. Let's look at 75 to 79. These commitments were made in relation to, okay, these commitments, meaning these things up here, were made in relation to indigenous health issues, but they form a template for the type of approach that is needed. I would agree with that that's the right answer because they're talking about the approach. Okay. Beginning with the ninth paragraph, lines 42 to 88, the focus of the passage shifts from, okay, ninth paragraph, 42. So up to that point, I know that they talked about problems up to here. Like literally this whole first part was her commiserating on what the government wasn't doing appropriately for the indigenous people. And then after that, it was talking about the solution. And hey, here's what we can do to reform this. So I'm going to try to find an answer that says that without reading too much into the passage. <clears throat> I think it's be criticism of the government's past approach and outlining a new approach. 38, the list in lines 55 to 74, which I already started to read, mainly serves to summarize actions specified in the statement of intent, propose modifications to the statement of intent, enumerate similarities, identify certain... Okay. Let's see. What's the statement of intent? In March this past year, the Prime Minister, the Leader of the Opposition, Ministers of Health and Indigenous Affairs, every major Indigenous and non-Indigenous peak health body and others signed a statement of intent to close the gap in health inequality. It commits to all of these things. Okay, so it's just commitments in the state of intent. Statement of intent. Um, 
Summarize action specified. Propose. Nope, not modifications. This is a new thing. Nope, not similarities. Nope, not inconsistencies. It's summarizing the actions that they should take. As used on line 72, targets most nearly means. Okay, targets. Measure, monitor, and report on our joint efforts in accordance with benchmarks and targets to ensure that we are progressively realizing our shared ambitions. So it goes with benchmarks, targets. It's going to be goals. <clears throat> okay, this one's a double. So it says, based on the passage, Kalma regards the audience of his speech. Okay, so we're, we want to know how Kalma feels about the audience. And since it tracks, I think I'm going to start at 80 to 84, they to challenges. <clears throat> They provide the basis. Who's they? Okay, indigenous peoples, because they just ended with indigenous peoples. So they provide the basis for the cultural shift necessary and how we conceptualize human rights in this country. Issues of entrenched and ongoing poverty and marginalization of indigenous peoples are human rights challenges. I don't hear anything about the audience there. I saw the word we in the next sentence, though, so I think that's dealing with how the author feels about the audience, because we means... Um, all of us, meaning the people that are reading the article with him or listening to the speech with him. So 84 to 88 is going to be our best lines. And we need to lift our expectations of what needs to be done to, so we need to lift our expectations of what needs to be done to address these issues and of what constitutes sufficient progress. Listen, guys, like the bet, the bar has been set really low. We need to raise the standards for these indigenous peoples. We need to expect more for these people to address these issues in the shortest possible time frame so that we can realize a vision of an equal society. Okay, let's go ahead and pick that one. He's calling the audience to do that. Uh -huh. uh, not skeptical, not poorly informed, not doubtful, overly tolerant of fact the government initiatives addressing equality faced by indigenous have not succeeded. Yes, overly tolerant. Hey guys, we've been just accepting this. We need to raise the bar now. What the government has been doing is not acceptable. <clears throat> okay, so I think we finished with that one. We just have one more. One central theme is of the passage is that expanding legal rights of citizens will not necessarily improve national health outcomes. It didn't really talk about legal rights. Human rights initiatives should generally receive more funding. Nope, funding wasn't the issue. The government actually said they put a lot of money towards it. Human rights should be used as a framework for government policy on indigenous issues. That is probably it. Focusing on indigenous people's rights detracts from more credit. No. It's got to be C. Okay, so we are on the last passage. We are almost there. And so far, I've been answering all these without reading the passages in totality, which is really nice. I'm just finding the answers. So I'm going to read the blurb for this one. This is the last one. It looks like it's another science. This passage is adapted from John Chambers and Jacqueline Mitten from Dust to Life, The Origin and Evolution of Our Solar System. Copyright 2014. Um, okay, so they're talking about the evolution and origin of our solar system. Differentiated asteroids. Ooh, this is important. They're defining something. Differentiated asteroids are made up of layers of different materials, such as iron core, a rocky mantle, and a volcanic crust. Okay, I'm actually going to draw a little picture so I can understand this. We've got an iron core. We've got a rocky mantle. And then we've got a volcanic crust. I don't know if you guys can see this. I'm so sorry. My handwriting's terrible. But for me, with science that understands stuff, sometimes I have to annotate and make visuals. So do what you need to do. Um, and that's called a differentiated asteroid. Primitive asteroids are undifferentiated asteroids that are thought to have changed little since they formed. Okay, I'm not really sure what that means, but we know it's different than a differentiated. Okay. Let's go to the questions. <clears throat> the main purpose of the passage. Well, we're going to skip 42. I have no idea what the main purpose of the passage is. As used in line 25, disrupt most nearly means. Most of the rocky mantle may be peeled away in small fragments, chips from the surface, while the iron core remains as a single piece, making it harder to disrupt later. Making it harder to fracture. Okay, um, 44, the passage, oh, we've got a double. The passage most strongly suggested if collisional erosion within the asteroid belt was sufficient to explain the situation discussed in the passage, then as a result, scientists would expect to find, okay, we're looking for collisional erosion. 
So I'm going to start with 35 to 37, perhaps to remain. <clears throat> perhaps Vesta and a handful of others are all that remain. Okay, I'm going to look above to see if it talks about the collision. And I don't see that. So I don't think that that's the right answer because I'm looking for the collisional erosion. So I'm going to go 38 to 39, however, to story. However, collisional erosion cannot be the whole story. Whoa. Okay, so it's probably in this paragraph. They're going to tell us why it's not the whole story. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Okay, so if now they're saying collisional erosion cannot be the whole story and it's a transition, it means they were just talking about collisional erosion here. Even though they didn't mention it verbatim, now I can conclude that because now in the next paragraph, they're gonna talk about how they need more than collisional erosion. So if it was just collisional erosion, then that means Vesta and a handful of others would be all that remain. So they're larger differentiated asteroids. Let's go find an answer to that. Vesta is not only, okay, I'm gonna go with A. Vesta is not the only large differentiated asteroid in the asteroid belt. The asteroid belt has far fewer primitive asteroids than it currently does. Um, iron fragments in the asteroid belt, okay. So Vesta is not the only large differentiated asteroid in the asteroid belt, hang on. So if most differentiated bodies broke apart early in the solar system, perhaps all the mantle material has been ground down to dust and lost over the billions of years. This would mean that intact differentiated asteroids are very rare in the asteroid belt today. Perhaps Vesta and a handful of others are all that remain. Okay, so differentiated asteroids are rare if collisional erosion is the only thing that would be part of the whatever. So, um... Is Vesta a primitive asteroid? Let's find out. Is Vesta a primitive asteroid? No, because primitive asteroids are undifferentiated. It would say that a f it said a few others besides Vesta would remain. I don't like this answer, but I need to move on. So I'm just going to go with Vesta is not the only large differentiated asteroid in the asteroid belt. And I'm going to star that because I'm not sure if it's a good match with A and come back to that. 46. The question in lines 47 to 49. Still to surface, mainly serves to. Okay, still to surface. Still, if almost all differentiated bodies were destroyed in violent collisions, how did Vesta survive with only a single large crater on its surface? Highlight an anomaly. Yes. How did this happen with Vesta? As used in lines 53 to 54, it contains most nearly means. Okay, 53 to 54. <clears throat> Let's see. Perhaps the parent bodies of the iron meteorites form closer to the sun in the region that now contains the terrestrial planets. So it's a region and it contains the terrestrial planets, encompasses. It's a region that encompasses the terrestrial planets. According to the passage, Bob Key and his colleagues explain the presence of iron fragments in the asteroid belt by asserting that the fragments were, okay, so we need to look where it talks about the presence of iron fragments in the asteroid belt. So let's go back. It's gonna be after 53 and 54. Okay, I'm seeing where it says iron fragments. Both iron and rocky fragments arrived in the asteroid belt, but only the stronger iron objects have survived. <clears throat> and it says gravitational perturbations from larger bodies scattered some of these fragments into the asteroid belt. So the gravitational, gravity from larger planets grabbed the, or took the iron fragments and pulled them into the asteroid belt and the stronger iron objects survive. Let's go see if I can find an answer to that. Due to the gravity of large objects, I like it. I'm gonna pick B. <clears throat> 49, data in the table best supports the conclusion that the majority of the mass in the asteroid belt as a whole is in asteroids that are 
Okay, so data in the table best supports the conclusion that the majority of the mass in the asteroid belt as a whole is in asteroids that are, okay, let's go back and look at the mass in the table. So we've got portion of belt's total mass. If I'm looking for a majority, I'm looking for high percentages. Whoa, this one's big. This one's kind of big. This one might be kind of big. Let's check out this one though. This is the biggest. Contain carbon, possibly parents of chondritic meteorites. Primitive, okay. Uh, mainly Vesta, thought to be, and these also thought to be primitive. Now I don't know if Vesta was primitive. I think Vesta was undifferentiated, uh, differentiated, so that was different, but most of them are primitive. Let's see if there's an answer with that. Yes, primitive, ha ha! I was thinking too much about it. I should have just looked at the answers. 50, assuming that the four largest asteroid belt objects are among the 11 listed asteroid types, which statement about those asteroids is best supported by data in the table? So I'm looking for the four largest asteroid belt objects. So that means I'm going to be looking at um, all objects in the belt, but the four largest. Ooh, it says all objects in the belt, but the four largest. Wow, notice how C goes down so much when you include the four largest. The four largest must be massive because all of a sudden uh, asteroid type C embodied more than half of all objects in the belt. But then if you take out the four largest, it's only 14%. Wow, okay, so. <clears throat> Let's go see if it says anything. Which statement about the asteroids is best supported by data in the table? None of them is type V. None of them is likely to contain carbon. One of them is type K. Two of them are the same type. Oh my gosh, I have no idea. Oh, okay. Well, I think so. If they look, if it goes down a lot, type C is one of the largest. What else goes down a lot? V goes down a ton, so that must contain some of the largest. Um, B must contain some of the largest. And they all contain, these two contain carbon. I don't know if Vesta contains carbon. Yeah, so I would say they probably contain carbon because two of them do. Let's see what type V and type K is. It says one of them is type K, none of them is type V. I disagree with that and I disagree with that. Okay, yeah, it's gotta be contains carbon. Oh no, wait, none of them is likely, not true. So we're gonna say two of them are the same type because they both contain carbon, I guess. Taken together, the passage in the table most strongly suggests that the model proposed by some astronomers would imply which conclusion about type C asteroids. This is a double. So I'm looking for um, which conclusion about type C asteroids if I look at the table and I look at the lines. So I'm gonna start with the lines and since they track, I'm actually gonna start with 60 to 64, both to Bell. So 60 to 64, both iron, wait, where does it go to Bell? Okay, both iron and rocky fragments arrived in the asteroid belt, but only the stronger iron objects have survived for the age of the solar system. Later on, the parent bodies of primitive meteorites formed in the asteroid belt. Okay, and they're asking about what from the table. Let me check again. Type C asteroids. Okay, if they're parents and they're primitive, they must have formed later. Let's see if I can find a match to that. Okay, if they form later, the only thing I see to that is that they're younger than type M. Let me see if M looks like it'd be older. M are metallic iron cores. So that, yeah, that would be the iron fragments that came first. That's my match. Okay, and I think I have one more left. I'm gonna go back. The main purpose of the passage is to discuss the study and tend to explain the high number of meteorites on Earth that have come from primitive asteroids. Okay, here's what I'm going to do. Since I didn't read it, a lot of times the main purpose or the primary purpose of the passage you can get in the first paragraph and typically the last sentence. That's where the thesis is. So I'm going to go back up there and see what the argument is. Now, it says these exotic meteorites must come from some other kind of parent body instead. I feel like that I don't have enough. I don't know what these exotic meteorites mean. So I'm gonna actually start at the top. Scientists believe the iron meteorites come from the cores of asteroids that melted. 
questions, but what happened to the corresponding rocky material that formed the mantle of these bodies? A few asteroids have spectra that match those of mantle rocks, but they are very rare. Some non-metallic meteorites come from asteroids that have partially or wholly melted, but these do not match the minerals we would expect to see in the missing mantles of the iron parent bodies. These exotic meteorites must come from other uh, kind of parent body instead. Okay, it doesn't talk about scarcity of a component. It doesn't talk about the high number of meteorites on Earth. Does it talk about prevalence of differentiated asteroids or does it talk about the conditions under which they formed? Definitely the conditions under which they formed. I'm gonna go with B. All right guys, so that's how you do the answer seeking strategy. Hang tight and I will reveal to you how I ended up doing on this test in a second. Okay guys, I just scored my practice and I missed seven questions, which landed me a 37 on the reading for the October 2022 test. This is on pace for a 740. Um, now I read some of the passages on the real thing and I missed five. So I just missed two more doing the answer seeking for the entire test than I did reading some of the passages. So hopefully I made a believer out of you today. If you don't like reading the passages or you run out of time, I highly suggest you use this strategy. So go ahead and practice it before the December test or whenever the next test is that you're going to take.